We thank you for giving us this time together. We pray that your Holy Spirit would just move among us and continue your good work in and through our lives. We thank you for the fellowship we have with you and with each other because of you, Lord. And we ask that you would teach us your word and you allow your word to be applied to our life and that we could always know you in a greater way and bring you glory. So we thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue our study in the book of Hosea. As we move through Hosea, we're in chapter 4. There's sections now as we unfold these chapters that I can't help but see so many parallels with that were with Israel and America today. And these historical accounts of what happened to Israel, I think can bring great understanding to us in the times we're living in. And hopefully through this time that we move through the rest of the book, that we'll have the Lord just speak to our heart in these truths. Now, in these chapters, there's a lot of heavy things, but what I saw in the beginning chapters as we read, God would always bring a hope to his people. A hope even after he told them, you must be corrected. Their judgment must come upon you and your land, but he would bring a hope and say, but I'll bring you back. And I love that about the Lord, that even in the correction, he gives me hope, and we always have our hope in the Lord, always. And so throughout the chapters as we unfold this, I hope to incorporate that from time to time as the Lord shows us in the scripture. In this time of Israel's past, the knowledge of God was fading in society. No longer, especially at this time in Hosea, no longer was the people of Israel and the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, following the commands of God. And the southern kingdom of Israel was not far behind. And as this took place in the kingdom, what happened is the knowledge of God the word of God and the presence of God and the commands of God were being removed from society. And when you remove the light of God, darkness rises. Darkness just naturally fills the void. In fact, the reality is, is darkness is already there. It's the light of God, the truth of God, that suppresses that darkness. But once the light is removed, darkness is before your eyes. In John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1 verse 5, it says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So if you remove God from a society, what's left? Darkness, evil, wickedness. And, and the illustration, Dustin, hit that first light. After so many decades, and part of that light is removed, it gets a little dimmer still manageable. We're okay. It's not a big deal. We can manage. We can get around. But as time goes on, then more light is removed or the lack of God's word is being taught. Hit the next one. Now it's a little darker, but people still manage. They still get around. They still function. But the more you take God's truth and God's commandments out of society, no longer to be accepted, no longer to be taught, 
more darkness comes. Hit the third one. And it just keeps progressing. And I believe we are in a place in the world, and especially for us in America, of this state, where the word of God, the truth of God, is being removed and taken away from society. God's moral standards are no longer as accepted as the right way of living. And so the presence of God within man, the teaching of God within a culture, is being removed until that final day when God takes the Holy Spirit through the church out. And then tribulation follows intensely. Because when the church and the true believers are gone and the restrainer is lifted, what fills the void? You can turn the lights on. Darkness. Darkness fills that void. Darkness, the very presence of darkness was already there. In fact, in Genesis, and I'll begin there, We'll go to Hosea after just a few verses here. But in Genesis chapter 1, it says that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God spoke light. For our basic understanding, God brought brought his presence upon the earth. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. But as that light continues to be removed from society the natural state of mankind and the land is darkness. And that's what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing in our time that we're living in. And mankind continues to push aside God's light out of society. I don't want to hear it. That's old-fashioned. I don't believe that. We have to adapt with the times. There's a new way of thinking. And the more you push the light out, darkness rushes in. And we see that. That was going on in Israel during this time that we're going to read in chapter 4. Actually, the whole book of Hosea. But in chapter 4, Of Hosea, it begins this way. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord has controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. God speaks to Israel and he says, hear you the word of the Lord. That that understanding there is God is telling Israel that you need to hear what I have to say. The word hear, the shema, if you would, in in the Hebrew, means not only to listen, but listen with the intent to respond. To listen with the intent toward obedience. That God was calling out to his people and say, hear me. And then after you hear what I have to say, respond to it appropriately. For your benefit, for your good. Remember, God made the light and he said, this is good. And mankind rejects the light. I don't want it. I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to do what God says. And the more they push God out, darkness rushes in. We don't want the knowledge of God in our schools. We don't want the knowledge of God in our public institutions. We don't want the 
knowledge of God in our culture, within our documents, in our history, or even in the public square, the, the opportunity to, to have those things debated. We don't want it. So at that point, mankind is pushing away the knowledge of God. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to act upon it. We don't want to listen to it. We don't want to tolerate it. And not only will that happen in a nation, but it can happen in individuals. If all of a sudden they're preoccupied, I don't have time to read my Bible. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to worship. I'm not in fellowship with believers in a church setting. And all of a sudden, where there's a lack of light, darkness rises. And then we wonder, why am I doing those things? Why am I going back to the way I used to be? Why, why, why are my thoughts the way they are right now? Because we're not pouring in the light of God's truth, his word, his understanding, the fellowship, the, the service to the Lord. And where we're, we're, there's a void of light, there's the, the understanding or the increase of, the way we look at it, the increase of darkness. And at this time in the nation Israel, there was a void of the truth that no longer were the teachings being brought forth to the people of God's commandments. No longer was the law of Moses and the, and the word of God read to the people of Israel. And what filled the void was that people began to do what was right in their sight, what they wanted to do. And as they continued down that path, the nation was getting or becoming more corrupt time after time, year after year. And to where God had to step in and bring his judgment, bring his correction. It wasn't without warning. God told the people several times. He raised up prophets and teachers and told them, don't go that way. That's the wrong direction. Don't, don't press the boundaries of my commands. Continue to walk in my ways. I want to bless you. I want to enrich you. I want to pour my spirit upon you. I want to love you and embrace you and fill you with all the goodness I have. But man was the one that said, no, we don't want that. In fact, Israel, what Israel did is they took a look at the nations around them, the pagan nations around them, and they said, we want to be more like them. We want to do what they're doing. And so no longer was the teaching of God's word listened to to the point where no longer it was even taught. It wasn't even mentioned. And this was happening in the northern kingdom of Israel. But the Lord said, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with you, uh, a place where he is contending with you because you're no longer living under his principles and under his commands. And again, let's not forget, God laid out these commands for the good of mankind. God's heart was good when God made man. He said, boy, it is good. So it wasn't God doing anything. It was basically man rejecting God. And this happened in Israel constantly. Time after time, they just kept pushing God and went into worshiping false idols. They pushed God aside, and they began to commit immoral behavior, acts of, of sin and sensuality. They began to just push God aside. In fact, the only people that they wanted to listen to, the only so-called teachers and rabbis they would listen to, are the ones that told them what they wanted to hear. And that was the society of the time that God is addressing Israel. 
and they removed the truth of God out of the land. The, the mercy of God, the, the ability to, to have mercy on others or, or to have that tolerance among each other, where there was a, a lack of tolerance. In fact, the only tolerance was accepted is if you spoke and did the things that everyone else spoke and said and did. And if you spoke against it, boy, those prophets were thrown in jail, they were chased out, they were murdered. They didn't want to hear it from them. The knowledge of God diminished in the land. No longer taught to their little ones, to their children. And when that took place, sin rushed in and filled the void. And so God is speaking to Israel, and in the next verse he says, by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. That concept of blood touching blood, it has the understanding that no atonement was given for bloodshed. No justice for wrongdoing. Even the most violent attacks, even those that would commit uh, murders would go unpunished in the land. Blood touches blood. It, it, it was not accounted for. Bloodshed was not accounted for. No, no longer corrected, no longer, you know, uh, brought to justice. But violent attacks and even murders, people went away scot-free, weren't punished for it. So it says, by swearing, by lying, by killing, and by stealing, and committing adultery, that those things were prevalent in the land. Not the knowledge of God, not the truth of God, not the word of God. Not even God's moral law or standards were spoken. But these things were there in the land. Committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. That understanding of break out basically is this. When God says, you can go this far and no further that they pushed the boundaries of that and they broke through those moral barriers and they wanted to do, well, we don't want to be restrained by what God says. We want to do what we want to do. Does that sound familiar at all in our land? That was going on in Israel. That was happening during this time in history. No longer, we're going to break forth. We're, we're no longer restrained. We, we no longer want to do what God says. Our, our moral compass, compass isn't based on God or his word. It's based on what we want and what we think is right. And they would push those boundaries. They would break forth and break through those barriers only to continue to do what they wanted to do. And there God said, because of all this, judgment must follow upon you. In fact, because of this progression, I can't even stop the judgment at this time. God was letting the people of Israel know that I can't even stop it at this time. You broke through where it has to be dealt with. I, I can't stop it. It's going to happen. And the Assyrian Empire was already established and conquering, and they were about to come into the land of Israel to conquer the land and scatter the people. And the southern kingdom of Judah was, was following Israel. I mean, you would think they would be like, man, if they're doing that and judgment's coming on them, I'm getting far away from them. But for some reason they thought, well, it won't happen to us. We're not as bad as them. 
Well, when only one light was off, it wasn't as dark as when all of them were off. But there is a progression to that that happens. And they didn't learn from it. And then later, the Babylonian Empire would come and conquer the southern kingdom. Just a, a little history lesson of what happened with Israel. But it, it, isn't there something to be said? Don't we use this phrase that we should learn from history? I mean, don't we? We do do that. We're like, we should really learn from history. Do we? <laughs> Not always. And I'm here to confess, do I? Not always. I get duped by all these little specials. I, I don't know why I put the apps on my phone, but every once in a while, these fast food joints tell me that they're going to give me something free. And I believe them. And I believe that what they're going to give me is going to be wonderful and delicious, but it's the same thing they gave me last time, indigestion. And they pop up and say, I'm going to give you indigestion again. I'm like, oh, where? Ready? You know, click my phone. Here, scan this. I need to learn from history myself. Mankind needs to learn from history. Hopefully the church can learn from their history. Because God still wants to save a remnant. He still wants to have his people to love him and obey him and bless his people. And I, I feel that you're part of that people that God wants to bless. As we learn, obey, and say, okay, Lord, thank you for the warnings. Thank you for them, Lord. Help me to, to make better choices now. Help me not to allow your light to diminish, but find ways to allow it to just rise up in a greater portion by serving you and, and reading and prayer and worship and fellowship with believers and allow that light that you placed inside me because I was the land that was dark and void until Jesus saved me. And then he brought his presence into my life. And I want the presence of God to rise up and fill this temple with his light. Because I know what it'll do. He'll, he'll get rid of the darkness. And, and that's why when John uh, was baptizing people and they came to you know him and they said, hey, Jesus is now baptizing people. Aren't you jealous of his ministry? And John said, no. In fact, he said, he must increase, and I must decrease. And the order of Scripture is true. When he increases, darkness decreases, or I decrease. So let God rise up. He, he, and he always teaches us and brings us that hope and that understanding, even through this, this passage we're in of correction. But here it goes and it says, Therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone dwelleth therein shall languish with the beast of the field, with the fowls of heaven, yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. You see, part of that judgment that comes upon the earth affects more than man. It affects the animal kingdom. It affects the, the plant life and crops, the ecology. It affects the climate. That, that when man continues to sin, when man, let me put it this way, when man pushes the light of God out of his life, I don't want to hear about God. I don't want to hear his Bible. I don't want to hear his word. I don't want to hear anything about that. I, I want to do what I want to do. And they push that aside. Then the natural progression is that sin is there. Or darkness is there. It then is prominent. It rises, if you would. And the whole earth is affected by that. 
the, the, the whole earth. So in that understanding, I agree with some of the thought today that all these things of climate and, and, and of the ecology and of the plant life and all these things that are affected in a negative way are man-made. That might surprise you. I, I truly believe that these things are man-made. But where I differ from the climate alarmists of today is that I don't think it's all because of fossil fuels. And I don't think it's because, you know, the solution is, well, if we ban gas stoves and furnaces. My grandma cooked on a gas. I have fond memories. Bad. Got to take it away, you know. I don't believe if you ban gas stoves and furnaces and force people not to drive, you know, cars that are powered by gasoline or trucks with diesel, I don't believe that that is going to fix things. But I do believe it's man-made. I do. And I believe it was caused by sin. And I believe because of the sin of man, as the sin of man increases, the whole earth mourns and languishes and cries out. You see this in Jeremiah chapter 12, specifically verse 4. So man, in his rebellion against God, tries to fix their own failures by punishing themselves instead of accepting the punishment that came upon God's Son, Jesus Christ. So we're going to atone for our sins and we're not going to cook with gas. I, I mean... I love firing up my gas grill. I love it when I have the, when I, when I can make the time and fire up the charcoal grill. I know. It's like, oh, you use charcoal? It tastes so good. And, and I'm not saying don't responsible as man. I'm not telling mankind not to be responsible with what he was given dominion over. I agree that we should be responsible. But I think if we see anything in the world today and the languishing of the world and the animal kingdom coming, parts of it coming into extinction and the crops not bearing their fruit and the barrenness and the droughts and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the earthquakes and all these things that we do see, and I do believe they're man-made, but I believe it was made because of man's sin that started in the Garden of Eden and continued on. And man wants to try to fix it, to atone for their own sin instead of repenting and turning to God. And asking God to forgive them of what's at the root of it all. And that's the sin of man. And so here it says that the whole world is going to be affected. And in verse 4, Yet let no man strive, nor reprove another. For the people are as they that strive with the priest. What, what it's basically saying is that no man will rebuke or contend with another. You see, in the northern kingdom in, of Israel, where the light of God's truth was diminishing, sin was abounding. Sin, sin was rising up. But what happened during the time of Israel that no one, it got to this place that no one would step in 
and contend with someone. No one would step in and say, you know, what you're doing is wrong. It got to the place where no one would contend. No one would say to the people, no, that's not right. Whether it was because they feared everyone else, because mob rules, if you would, or if they were corrupt themselves, or whatever the situation was. But in the northern kingdom of Israel, when the people of Israel started doing wrong and worshiping false idols, false gods, involved in sexual immorality, through, through, through fornication and evil temple, even temple prostitution, when, when people were taken away and not adhering to the dietary laws that God had given them, and allowing even their holy days to be corrupt and paganized, when that was going on in Israel, there wasn't a voice that said, it's wrong. It's wrong. You shouldn't do that. Now, there may have been a voice prior that was trying to say it's wrong, but it was silenced. It wasn't heard. We don't want to hear that. They would, they would then ostracize them. They, would, they may even kill them. They didn't want to hear those things. So God says, at this time, yet no man strive nor reprove another. That... that no one's going to come in and say it's wrong what you're doing. And it also says, for the people are as they that strive with the priests. That when the light of God is diminished from our land or from Israel, and someone comes in and wants to tell them what you're doing is wrong, then the society silence them, doesn't want to hear that. Even though the people are beginning to break through the moral boundaries of God, beginning to accept things, beginning to declare things that are outside the norm for generations, outside the norm of the beginning when God called his people. These were the acceptable ways of behavior among men. And at this time in Israel's history, man decided, I don't want to listen to God. I don't want the presence of God. I don't want the word of God. I don't want even anyone that declares what God says to me to be heard. I want to do what I want to do and the moral boundaries that God has set up they broke through those boundaries and they did what they wanted to do. And in that land, the only thing that people would agree on was wrong was the one against, who, against the one who was telling them that's wrong. Then they would say, wow, you can't say that. And this was happening in the land of Israel. And because of that, that nation was brought into great judgment. Where even the priests they would strive with, even those that, that held that moral standard, those that once were accepted as, as a, a people that should be listened to, a, a people that are good and righteous, they were striving against them and now calling those good people evil and the evil people good. And Israel went through this stage, this phase in their history. And I'm afraid we're not learning from history. And we need to learn from history. That it's okay to stand and say, you know, that's wrong. That, that, that's not the right way. It doesn't mean I don't love people. That's the lie to keep you from saying it's wrong. Are you kidding? I'm telling you it's wrong because I love you. I mean, I don't know about you, but, you know, I raised a few kids and been in charge over grandkids. And when my kids went to play with something that was bad, I didn't say, well, you know, I know those red fire ants are very cute. 
and they probably tickle and they crawl on you. I don't want to judge you for playing with those, so you go right ahead and play with those. Was that an act of love? Or was it more of an act of love when I came in and said, no, no, don't, don't touch that. They will hurt you. They will bite you. They will burrow inside you. They will cause you great pain. Don't play with that. There's a lot of wonderful things you can play with. There's a lot of fun you can have over at the park that I took you to. There's a lot of great things. We can climb trees. We can run through the grass. But, but let's move away from that. I think that was a greater act of love than just saying, little Johnny, you do what you want to do if it makes you happy. That didn't, that, that's not love. So it has nothing to do with, I don't love people. It has everything to do with, I love the truth. And I still believe there is a truth. And I believe God holds that truth. And I believe God is good. And God wants to bless his people that walk in his ways. And the only reason he would inhibit them is because he knows in the end it will harm them. So maybe I just have a different view of God. So God's not mean keeping you from something. God is good, and that's why he keeps you from certain things. And Israel would not learn this. No, we'll do what we want to do. And God said, I, I, the only end to that is judgment. The only end to that is, is a destructive, it's a destructive path you're on. But then even in that, he said, once you finish that path, then I'm going to bring you hope because I'll bring the remnant, the people left back into the land and restore them. And I think the world, unfortunately, is on that path. And it might take the great judgment, the great tribulation. It might take that. But then the hope Jesus Christ will then establish his kingdom forever and ever. A world that is good because it has the right leader in charge. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. The right leader is in charge. And in thinking that, I thought, I just want to make sure that the right leader is in charge of my life. And, and I got to tell you, the right leader over my life is not Kirk Dudek. I've been known once or twice, three or four, thousand, <laughs> ten thousand times to maybe make a wrong judgment on what it was best for me or others, but I know that there's one that has never made a wrong decision about what is right. And I'm not afraid to tell you that's my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's who it is. And so God encourages us as a people. I, I was reading in Ephesians chapter 5. I, I just want to read this to you. I'm going to read it out of the NLT. I use the King James, but I I just was uh, enjoying this out of the NLT. In Ephesians 5, I'm going to read a bit, it, verses 1 through 21. I think it's instructive for us. In verse 1 it says, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talking, coarse jokes, these are not for you. 
Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. So don't be fooled by those who try to excuse their sin. The anger of God will fall on all those that disobey. Don't participate in the things that people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of the light. For the light within you produces only wit that which is good and right and true. I'll read on, but I want to pause on that. The light that's in you. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you know you're a sinner, you've done wrong. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And he rose again, and you ask him to forgive you and believe that, then that light of truth comes in, and you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And now, allow that light that's in you, let it come forth and produce the good stuff that God has for your life and the effectiveness that it can have on others. Don't let the light fade. Kind of feed it, you know. The flesh and the spirit, whatever you feed, is going to dominate your life, is going to be stronger. Feed on the things of God. Watch what a difference it makes for you and for the people around you. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Be, be willing to tell someone, no, no, I don't think that's right. Yeah, but what will society say? What will the world do? Will I lose my job? What will happen to me? Whatever the situation was or is, was happening in Israel at the time. And they chose the path of not saying what is right and true. And it didn't end well for them. So, so let that light expose some of those things. Don't, don't be mean and negative. Don't be nasty. We're, we're children of the light, but also that light or God is love. Let the love of God reign in your hearts and, and the peace of God rule in your bodies. And show that love of God to others. Caref carefully de uh, determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds and evil or darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful to even talk about those things that ungodly people do in secret. But the evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it says, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you life. Then I'm going to be like, Okay, Lord, I want to live for you. I don't want to be suppressed by the world, and I don't want to get to where we have little secret churches. Hey, did you know Jesus is good? Yeah, yeah, but don't tell anyone. They'll arrest you. You know, no, I want to tell people, the Lord is good. The Lord loves them. He, in fact, he loves them so much he died on a cross for them. He loves them. Wake up, he says. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Do not act thoughtlessly, but understand what God wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your heart, and give thanks for everything God the Father in the name of the, everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And further, submit yourself one to another in the reverence of God. Stay in fellowship. You know, sometimes you think you're all alone. And you, and you go through this world and there are times I think, man, I don't really fit in it, you know? But when I come here and I see you guys, I'm like, I guess I'm in pretty good company. There's, there's, a, there's a group of believers that, that want to follow God, love God. They, they want to do what's right and I want to encourage them to do right and I want them to encourage me to do right and then I want to be a light and a witness and let others know 
the goodness of God that he has for them. And the greatest goodness is Jesus died for them and loves them. And so I encourage you, let your light shine. The world around us wants to put a basket over it. Remember that scripture? Don't let it do it. You're a city set on a hill. I was set on the hill of Calvary with my Savior who made me a new creature in Christ. I want to live in that newness and walk in it. Share it with others. Because I can tell you, there's a lot of people that, that look like they're having a good time, but I don't know if that's true. But there are times I get together with believers and I can't stop laughing. I'm having a great time because we're fellowshipping in the one who is true, the Lord Jesus Christ. Know that he's with you. Know that he loves you. We got a lot to cover as we move to Hosea. So I'm just going to end there for today. Father, thank you. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word and the things that it declares. May our hearts continue to be moved towards you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. And if any of us, Lord, had drifted off the, the righteous path, we thank you for bringing us back. May you fill us once again with your spirit. And may we walk in the truth of your life. And we thank you that it's your goodness that leads us to repentance, your goodness that keeps us. We thank you, we praise you, and Lord, we need you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name.